Hello, this is Chuck King from Ford City, Pennsylvania on Tuesday, May 26, 2020, bringing you the daily Bible study. We're in Titus chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. So we'll finish, we'll finish Titus today and go on to uh, Philemon or Philemon tomorrow. All right, Titus 3, 1. Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed. Paul is reminding Titus to remind all the disciples to submit to rulers and authorities, and they should be known as obedient people who are ready to do good works and good deeds, which are always biblical deeds. So the the believers in Christ, disciples, even under the authoritarian rule that they had back then in the first century are called to be submissive to the authorities. And we struggle with this in the USA because we've, we've had freedom in our genes and uh, all our lives, and we, we don't like people telling us what to do. But biblically, it is not right to resist and malign and come against governmental authorities. Now, when they ask us to disobey the scripture, we must obey the Lord and then uh, take whatever, whatever consequences come in order to be faithful not to the Lord, or to, to be faithful to the Lord, not, not rebellious against authorities. We, we cannot rebel against the Lord. So this conflict comes in our lives, when authorities tell us to disobey the Lord, biblical commands like preaching the gospel instead of uh, obeying authorities and stop doing that. So we know, we know the Lord is calling us, even in persecution, to preach and be faithful and to be obedient, but yet there's that tension of yielding in where we live to our, our local and regional authorities. Verse number two, to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. So to malign means to say bad things about people. Uh, instead, we're to be peaceable and gentle and being considered of all men. So as Christians, we, we do need to be careful what we say about people and even about our governing leaders. It's one thing to disagree and to do so strongly. It's another thing, it's another thing to malign them, to say bad things. So let the Holy Spirit convict and transform us in our behavior toward people. Verse 3, For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. So Paul's reminding us of what it was like when we lived as unbelievers. Now we're disciples in the kingdom of God and living for Jesus to be his example among the unbelievers. And we are, we are to be holy people. We used to be like the world. And what is the world like? Uh, foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to lust and pleasures, always uh, uh, spending time or lives in malice and envy and hateful, hating one another. This is a description of what the wisdom of the world produces in a culture. If you can read about this in James, you can read about it in uh, Galatians 5, uh, in Romans 8, you can see how the work of the flesh is uh, horrible and divisive and miserable and how it creates all kinds of divisions. We are not to be like that anymore. Verse 4, But when the kindness, kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, now we're, we're going to contrast what we used to be like in all the foolishness of the world, but when the kindness, you see the Romans four, uh, chapter 2 verse 4 tells us that it's the kindness of the Lord 
that leads us to repentance. So we know that it is God's kindness that opens our eyes and ears to to understand the gospel, to be convicted of our sins, given grace to turn away and re, and repent and become a new creation in Christ. This is what Paul's talking about when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared. This is the revelation of the new covenant in Jesus Christ. Verse number five, he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. So how did he save us? It wasn't because of our works or our good deeds, our human nature uh, activities that that uh, even though religious can't save us, not on the basis of our, our own works, but according to the mercy of God. Uh, Romans 11, right at the end, talks about this, how God has held us all over under disobedience, that he might have mercy to us all. And then Paul starts out chapter 12 of Romans by saying that we ought to, in view of, in view of the mercy of God, this mercy that saved us when we were so lost, so blind, in view of the mercy of God, we should bring our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable, which is our spiritual service of worship, and our minds to be renewed and not conform to this world, that we might know the will of God. This is the, the basis upon which he saved us. By grace, by faith, the Lord has saved us according to his mercy. And he washed us, the scripture says, uh, uh, through regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. So there is a transformation, a changing, a washing away of the sins, a cleansing of our old nature, and a, a regeneration or a transformation, a renewal by the Holy Spirit that must take place in the life of the believer. Paul's reminding Timothy of how we were saved. Verse 6, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So the Holy Spirit has been poured, poured out upon us through Jesus, richly or abundantly poured out upon us through Jesus Christ. Verse 7, so that being justified by, by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So we are not justified by our works, but we're justified by his grace, his power, his ability that comes only from him, that, it, that makes us able to be obedient to his word. The grace of God motivates us, teaches us to deny ourselves and to be righteous and to live righteously. This is what brings eternal life, and this is our hope. Uh, we're looking forward to eternal life. We are heirs with Jesus Christ of eternal life because of his justification. Verse number eight, this is a trustworthy statement. And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for men. So Paul, with great emphasis here, tells us that this is the message that needs to be preached, that needs to be taught to all people, to the disciples, and even as we preach to the lost, they need to understand that we are saved by, by grace, by faith, because of, of Jesus Christ and his redemption. And these are the things that, that, that are good and profitable. You see, th this is what we should be teaching. We need to continually remind people about the doctrines of the New Testament. I always tell you, that I am amazed how ignorant people are, Christians are, of the New Testament. They don't know it very well. They just get snippets of it, maybe a little bit in devotions. They hear a preacher preach. But to really understand the magnitude of this message, you have to be a student of the Word of God. Meditate upon it. Make it your doctrine, your way of living. This is what is profitable and good. For all people, verse 9, but foolish controversies and genealogies and strife 
and disputes about the law, avoid, excuse me, but avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. So what's unprofitable and what is worthless? It's foolish controversies and striving and fighting and disputing over the old covenant. The old covenant is not the issue. But we ought to be teaching and emphasizing the New Testament uh, reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 10. Reject a factious man after a first and second warning. So there will be people that want to cause uh, divisions and controversies. And when we realize there's someone among us that's doing that, they should be warned. And if they don't stop, they should be warned again. And this is, this is the basis upon which we deal with people. If they repent, once confronted and rebuked for their sin, they can be restored. But after, after a first and second warning, and we even follow Matthew, Matthew 18 by going privately, then with two or three, then, then before the whole church, if they reject those warnings and persist in their arrogance, we must put them out of our fellowship. Verse 11, knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. So a factious man who likes to, to uh, create controversy and strife and disputes about the law in the church needs to be dealt with because they are out of line. They are walking in the flesh. Verse 12, when I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, make every effort to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. So Paul wants Titus to come with Artemis and Tychicus to come meet him in Nicopolis. So apparently at this time, he's not in prison. At this time, he wrote to Titus. He wants to meet him in the Coppolis. Verse 13, diligently help Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way so that nothing is lacking for them. So a couple of other brothers who were ministering and traveling, apparently, Zenos and Apollos, they, he asked Titus to help them and give them some aid or some support so they wouldn't be lacking. Verse 14, our people must also learn to engage in good deeds to meet pressing needs so that they will not be unfruitful. So Paul makes it uh, obvious to us that good deeds uh, of meeting pressing needs of the poor, those who lack, is what the church should be involved in. He says our people, meaning the disciples, need to learn how to develop a ministry to those in, who have pressing needs. And this, this makes us fruitful. This is important for us to understand. And this is one of the reasons why during this time of, of isolation and in, in the COVID-19 crisis, when you can't travel, you can't do missionary work personally, but we can still help, help our people and this is why we've been sending, the last couple of weeks, we've been wiring funds to our faithful partners in, in about nine or ten different countries who are, their people are really suffering, can't get food. They're, 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 uh, we had testimonies of, of no food at all, only drinking water, crying out to God in misery. And then the donations of the people came and we were able to to give those donations, although they're short term, they're helping the people meet their pressing needs at this time. And this biblically is called fruitfulness. So it's good to give to the poor who are in need. And that's what we'll be doing until we're able to get back out there and visit them personally and, and continue with our projects of safe water and small animals and preaching the gospel and training disciples. So if you see those testimonies on Facebook, know that when you give, you are giving 
to the, those with pressing needs, and it is a fruitful, it is a fruitful discipline to give to the poor. Verse 15, all who are with me greet you, greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Always talking about grace, the grace of God. And so we have this last chapter of Titus, and we can apply it by understanding, first of all, that God is calling us uh, throughout the New Testament, even though our rulers are wicked and uh, ungodly, that we are to still submit to authority because authority comes from God. Now, when they cross the line and command us to disobey the Lord, then we have to choose to obey the Lord and accept whatever persecution comes our way. And we are called to good deeds, not to, not to say nastier uh, things or to malign people, but to be known as people of the fruit of the Spirit, loving people. Because we used to be foolish and carnal and divisive, like the people of the world fighting all the time. But the kindness of God led us to repentance and saved us by his mercy and grace and washed us by the Holy Spirit. And we are by grace now justified, looking forward to e eternal life. Praise God. And we should preach and teach confidently on these things because the, the people of God are to be obedient to the word. And we must emphasize that these are good and profitable teachings for all people. We've got to stay away from worldly carnal controversies. And in fact, if we are a factious person, we need to be dealt with, rebuked uh, and rejected after a first and second warning for causing that kind of trouble in the church. Because a person who causes trouble like this is perverted and sinning and self-condemned. And then we finished up with Paul's personal notes to Titus about his other team members. So we need to be involved in good works and to meet the pressing needs of others. Let's pray even now in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for the word of God in this final chapter of Titus. We ask you, Lord, to impress upon our hearts and minds the reality of the gospel and the way we should live in this world while we look forward to the coming of Jesus, that we should be people who are walking the fruit of the Spirit and not in divisive carnality, that we are called to love all people and to show by our example that Jesus Christ is Lord, that we are transformed by his mercy, grace, and power, and that we are about doing the kinds of deeds that are pleasing to him. Father, thank you. Take notice of our outreaches to the poor, of everyone who gives and prays, and how we help people in their time of need. Lord, help us to be fruitful. May your name be glorified. We pray now that you would, you would put an end to this crisis in our nation and among the nations so that the gospel would be freely preached once again. And your people would be blessed and, and fruitful. We ask you, Lord, to protect us and deliver us from all sickness. And those who are sick, Lord, raise them up by your healing power. Keep us in your love and mercy, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so please share the videos with people. It just takes a moment to, to share it with your other friends and family. And we're we're asking the Lord to help us to keep preaching and teaching the word as, as long as he gives us that ability and that grace. All right. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Be well and safe, and we'll see you tomorrow.